Good afternoon, everyone. We will be getting started in just a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laurel Aragona from Pseudical Labs and a co-chair of the Body Art Committee. And we would like to thank you for joining us for the APTO Professional Development Series. We are here today with Kathleen Lewis and Tattoo Pigment, Regulation, Chemistry, Photostability, and Potential Complications in the Human Body and FDA Laws and how they relate to the body art industry. Kathy, Kathleen Lewis, currently serves as a senior advisor to the director of Office of Cosmetics and Colors. In this role, Kay acts as a liaison with the Office of Compliance for Cosmetics and Colors Enforcement Action, among other duties. Prior to assuming this role, Kay was the district director in the San Francisco District Office located in Alameda, California, where she provided leadership in directing and managing regulated industry in the areas of human and animal food, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, biologics, and bioresearch monitoring through inspections, investigations, recall, audits, and complaint handling. In addition, Kay worked cooperatively with the state to leverage resources and meet the agency's mission. Kay served on the Food Field Committee and the Produce Safety Network for the Human and Dietary Sub for for the Human and Animal Foods Program. Other management positions that Kay has held include team leader for labeling and dietary supplements in CSPAN's Office of Compliance, watch commander in the Division of Food Defense Targeting and branch chief for blood and tissue compliance in Sieber's Office of Compliance and Bi Biologic Quality. Kay is well known to the Office of Cosmetics and Colors for her involvement in cosmetic and color ad activities during her time in compliance. Finally, Kay received her Bachelor of Arts degree in biology in 1980 from the University of Toledo and her Juris Doctor with a concentration in health law in 2009 from Concord Law School Kaplan University. In addition, she has received numerous awards and accolades in her 30 plus years with the agency. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to hold on to your questions or type them into the questions box during the presentation, and we will read them out at the end. 
And we will also be opening the phone lines at the end of the presentation and unmuting people to ask their own questions as well. Um, so now I will turn it over to Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for signing up for the webinar, and I hope this information is informative for you. Next slide. Okay, after this presentation, um, hopefully you will have a better understanding of regulatory status of tattoo inks and tattoo pigments, um, the chemistry, uh, potential impurities in pigments, the photo stability, the marketplace, and potential complications. Next slide. So this slide gives you the definition of tattoo inks and that they are regulated as cosmetics because they fit the federal definition of a cosmetic. In other words, they're intended to be rubbed, poured, sprinkled, or sprayed on, or introduced into, or otherwise applied to a human body or any part thereof for cleansing, beautifying, promoting attractiveness, et cetera. In addition, um, the pigments in tattoo inks are regulated as color additives. However, FDA hasn't traditionally exercised its authority due to other competing um, public health priorities and a previous lack of evidence of safety problems specifically associated with these pigments. Next slide. So um, this slide gives you some of the regulatory background for tattooing. It describes how the inks fall under FDA jurisdiction. Um, because tattoo pigments are in part, in part color, which is the definition of a color additive. All color additives are pre-approved for use in food, drugs, and co cosmetics and medical devices, which are listed in code of, the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 73, 74, and 82. However, there have been no color additives approved for an injected use. Now, I know the industry has a problem with the use of the term injected, but um, that's how the agency views um, tattoo inks being transdermally placed under, uh, under the skin. So that's an injection as far as we're concerned. Um, next slide. So this slide um, describes the types of pigments, inorganic versus organic. Um, the inorganic pigments can be natural or synthetic, and the organic pigments are, are normally synthesized from um, these various elements. Next slide. So this slide describes um, the classification of pigments via the color index. The color index describes the essential colorant or a dye or pigment by application class. It assign, assigning a relevant color index generic name and color index constitution number allows identification by a world recognized system. Next slide. So this gives some examples of inorganic pigments and their color additive number. Next slide. So here's the limitations with inorganic pigments. The iron oxides usually fade or change color and historically used mercury and cadmium salts are, are toxic to the human blood system. So next slide. So um, here are some of the potential impurities in, in inorganics. Um, lead, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, those are all impurities that we um, normally check, well, we're trying to develop methods to check for in um, tattoo inks. So some of the methods that have been developed are inductively coupled plasma or atomic absor absorption techniques. Next slide. So. Organic pigments, in contrast, typically have um, more intense colors and a wider range of colors. 
and then some of them are removable by laser treatment. Next slide. Here are the um, potential impurities in organic in in organic tattoo pigment. Um, the polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons, um, primary aromatic amines. Many of these are carcinogens, and um, but some of them can be detected by detected by liquid chromatography, chromatography or gas chromatography techniques. Next slide. So let's talk about um, the marketplace. Next slide. So um, general tattoo inks are suspensions of non-soluble pigments with binders and solvents. Um, the solvents can be like alcohol or um, ethanol, and binders can be polymers or shellac. Um, their finely dispersed pigment mixtures are stabilized um, using surfactants. Otherwise, the pigments agglomerate. You can also add preservatives that uh, prevent microbial spoilage. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about general body tattooing. Next slide. Okay, first up is permanent makeup. Until permanent makeup came along, most body artists shied away from the face. But now this technique can be applied to the eyes, the lips, eyebrows, et cetera. Um, other names that, that you can call it instead of permanent makeup include micropigmentation, dermapigmentation, and cosmetic tattooing. Next slide. This is just an example of um, types of permanent makeup for the eyebrows and for the lips. Next slide. Okay, this slide describes the makeup of the industry. Um, it, it, you can have technicians that are diverse. Some are RNs, RNs or MDs. Um, you can have them as that salons or tattoo parlors. Um, those are usually regulated by your local and state departments. Um, some people do it at home. You can have a workshop setting. Sometimes. Um, anesthesia is injected when it's in a medical setting or there's no anesthesia. There is a variety varying uh, stero sterile techniques as well. Next slide. Okay, and these are some of the complications that you can run into. Um, the swelling and the cracking and peeling, uh, granuloma, keloid, all types of allergic reactions, et cetera. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry about the dog. Um, this is an example of an allergic reaction. You can actually see some of the swelling there. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about adverse reactions to permanent makeup. Next slide. So from 1988 to 2003, we, FDA only got five reports of adverse reaction. In contrast, from 2003 to 2004, we got a, another 150 adverse reaction reports. So um, as you can see, there, in the past, there was no reason to necessarily exert our regulatory authority until we received um, an influx of adverse reaction reports. Um, the reports talked about tenderness or swelling, itching, granulomas, et cetera. Next slide. So in 2004, um, we found out about, well, we alerted the public to um, concerns with pr Premier Pigment brand of ink shades. And we published it in our talk paper. The firm actually recalled um, the ink, and it was documented as a case study in the archives of dermatology, and also it was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Now, in, 
in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was published as a study of 101 patients that it exhibited adverse reactions after having permanent makeup procedures. The findings showed that applications of permanent makeup may result in serious long-term disfiguring reactions. The product line of the ink associated with the reactions in the study were recalled. Next slide. Okay, this is um, uh, this slide and the next slide talks about another um, incident where Star Bright Colors, their website bragged about no preservatives or additives, and um, it resulted in adverse reactions. Next slide. So, um, as a result of them not using um, preservatives. Belgium withdrew um, their tattoo inks from the market because of microbial contamination. FDA analyzed it and found Pseudomonas originosa and um, a mold, which is acrimonium. As a result, Cybrite did do a recall on their ink, but the inks became contaminated because they eliminated the preservative from their ink formula. Next slide. So in 2011, there were several outbreaks in the U.S. linked to um, tattoo ink. Non-tubercular mycobacterium was isolated from the ink bottles, along with other pathogens. And that was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Next slide. So NTM, or non-tubercular um, mycobacterium, is commonly found in um, public water supplies. Usually can't be removed by filtration because of the spores and the, they can only be destroyed by sterilization. Um, they, it can also be introduced by a user like by diluting your inks with water or um, pouring back unused ink into a stock bottle, that kind of thing. Next slide. So most recently, FDA issued an advisory in um, May of last year warning consumers about tattoo artists and retailers um, using inks contaminated with micro microorganisms. Um, there were five inks that were voluntarily recalled, and you can find that information at the link. Next slide. Um, one website claimed that um, a menu, uh, that the uh, tattoo ink was approved for polymethyl methacrylate for medical uses, and it was a false claim because FDA hasn't approved any color additive for that use. And in addition, there have been no pigments that are approved for use in tattooing under FDA. Next slide. So here's some, some problems that we see with um, tattoos and permanent makeup. The pigments haven't been approved by FDA for cosmetic uses. And safety for a skin injection hasn't been demonstrated. There's no color additives for inject listed for injection um, for injected use and we know that adverse events have occurred and also removal is difficult next slide so here's some list of um, how tattoo ink or tattoos can be removed but um, even with laser treatments they're um, painful and expensive and the same with surgery and there also may be scarring next slide So current issues include contamination by NTM in sealed bottles of tattoo ink. Um, sometimes when people use alcohol as a preservative, it's not bactericidal. Um, the sterilization methods haven't all been tested or um, to demonstrate the safety of the product. And um, 
industry hasn't demonstrated the microbiological expertise that's needed in this particular instance. And F frankly, FDA's rapport with industry is limited, although we're trying to address that in um, working with the AFTO community. Next slide. So here are some questions for consideration. Single versus multiple use for um, your, your injection device. Um, preservation requirements. Sterilization treatment options. And required labeling statements. Just something to think about. Next slide. Obviously, we need more information on tattoo ink ingredients and we're in the process of sampling and testing tattoo inks to learn more about the ingredients and the contaminant. Um, processing methods. FDA is planning to inspect more manufacturers to learn more about the prevailing practices. Next slide. Here's our list of future goals. We want to better understand um, composition and methods of preservation and safe use. We want to develop better tools to assess human health risks from um, inks and pigments. We want to better understand the industry as a whole. And we're one, we're, we want to continue our outreach with our stakeholders. Um, and then there's also some consideration of changing the color additive enforcement policy as well. Next slide. So here's the summary of challenges, the regulatory or oversight. How, how much should we regulate? Um, develop a better tools to assess the, the health risks. Improvement and recognition of problems, both clinically and scientifically. And obviously communication and outreach with our stakeholders and constituents. Next slide. So, in the marketplace, there's a wide variety of pigments and tattoos and permanent makeup. Um, there's been adverse reactions to which FDA has responded. There's been misleading websites that we've identified. Um, and tattoos are difficult to remove. In addition, again, no pigments have been approved for, by FDA for tattooing for cosmetic purposes. Next slide. So for further information, you can go to our website at the link, and that will give you some additional information on tattoos and permanent makeup. Next slide. Um, I just want to thank um, Drs. Linda Katz, Julie Barrows, Bakhti Pedagara Harp, and Mary Anita Perez Gonzalez for providing the information and sharing their slides. Next slide. I think that's the end of the first presentation. Yep, that's the end. Give me one second to pull up the other one. Okay. Okay, can we advance to slide three? Okay, here's my outline. Um, we'll talk about what is a cosmetic. And some of this may be a little bit redundant from the last presentation, but um, it's still relevant. We'll talk about what is body art um, and how the regulations apply, and then we'll give some parting consideration. Next slide. Okay, this is the, def the federal definition for cosmetic. And as I said before, it's an article intended to be rubbed, poured, sprinkled, or sprayed on, introduced or otherwise applied to the human body as part of cleansing, beautifying, promoting attractiveness, et cetera. Next slide. Now I know that you know everybody knows what body art is, but I just wanted to put this in context for our conversation. And so it's defined as body piercing, tattooing, branding, scarification, subdermal implants, tongue splitting, transdermal implants or the application of permanent cosmetics. Next slide. 
So um, this talks about how FDA regulates um, tattoos as cosmetics. Um, the inks are used in intradermal tattoos, um, and so they're, the pigments are used as color additives, and that's how they're um, regulated under FDA laws and jurisdiction. The actual practice of tattooing is regulated by your state and local jurisdictions. Next slide. So again, FDA has not, has not traditionally exercised the regulatory authority for color additive or pigments um, used in tattoos. Why? Next slide. Oh, yeah. So, well, the reason why is that we had com competing public health priorities and resources. Um, in addition, previously there was no evidence of safety problems associated with pigments. But here's what changed. In 2003-2004, we got that 150 reports of adverse events. And then in 2012, we got reports of infections. In 2017, we had recalls. And so the concern has escalated. There's been widespread concern about um, pigments used in tattooing. Next slide. And the areas of concern, obviously, are infections resulting from tattoos, um, increasing variety of pigments and diluents used in tattooing, um, no color additive approval, and tattoo removal. Next slide. So uh, again, color additives require pre-approval, and use of an unapproved color additive in a product makes it makes the ink adulterated. Many pigments used in tattoo inks are not approved for skin contact because they're made from industrial grade um, colors that like are used for printer's ink or auto paint. Next slide. So in 2018, FDA conducted um, 12 inspections of tattoo inks, uh, manufacturers and distributors. Um, we collected 60 ink samples and analyzed them for um, microbial analysis using the Bacteriological Analytical Manual or BAM Chapter 23. Next slide. So seven out of the 60 um, sampled inks were identified as being of regulatory concern. There were um, microbial species of concern, including Pseudomonas and uh, E. coli, Staph aureus, and Candida. Um, two of the samples had high counts greater than 1,000 colony-forming units per milliliter of bacteria. Three samples had bacterial species of concern including Bacillus cereus and Clostridium. And two samples had both high counts and species of concern. And you can see this, uh, see more of this information at the link that's in the slide. Next slide. 25 out of 60 or 42% of the sample showed bacterial growth um, at the lower level, which was less than a thousand CFUs per milliliter, and they were non-pathogenic. 47% um, of the samples did not show any bacterial growth using the BAM23 method. But 33 of those 60 tattoo ink samples were labeled as sterile or sterilized. Next slide. So three of the firms voluntarily recalled their tattoo inks, and that included Scalp Aesthetics, Color Art Ink, uh, DBA Solid Ink, and Dynamic Color. Next slide. Those three firms were also sent warning letters in September of um, 2019 um, and for Color Art Ink, DBA Solid Ink was charged with adulteration due to microcontamination 
and insanitary conditions of their facility, and also misbranding because um, they claimed that the, the product was sterile. Dynamic Color uh, was charged with adulteration for microbial contamination, and Intense Products was um, charged with adulteration due to micro contamination and misbranded um, due to labeling claims of sterility. Next slide. Now, after the warning letters were issued, AFCO Body Art Committee held a conference call to discuss the warning letters. And these are some of the questions that were asked during that um, session that I didn't necessarily have the official answers to, so I'd like to provide those answers now. The first question was, why were the warning letters issued? even after the recalls had happened. Well, the fact of the matter is, even when a firm does issue a recall for an effective product on the market, a warning letter can still be issued because um, the adulterated or misbranded product was actually put out by that manufacturer. The law says that manufacturers are responsible for their product and they have to be um, responsible for the safety of their product. So if we find and can demonstrate that um, a product is not safe and has been out on the market, even though the product is recalled, we can still issue that administrative action of a warning letter. Next slide. So one question was, what directions do FDA give the facility? And FDA doesn't give specific direction to a facility or a manufacturer on how to bring their product into compliance. It's the manufacturer's responsibility to make sure that their product is safe for the intended use. Another question was, have these problems that were identified in the warning letters been addressed? So FDA works with the firms to, in response to, their, to the regulatory action, but specific regarding a firm's response and the adequacy of that response, we, we can't openly discuss that. Next slide. Another question was, does FDA come back and retest the ink? And yes, FDA can retest the inks to check for microbial contamination, to check that those microbial contamination issues have been addressed. Um, we can accomplish that by collecting samples during a follow-up inspection or after the recall or as a part of a survey for cosmetic problems that may include tattoo ink. Another question was why didn't Intens issue a recall? And again, um, we work with the firms and the, with their response to any regulatory action, but we can't talk about those specifics. Next slide. Um, who is responsible for disseminating information to the industry from the warning letters and what are the next steps? Well, FDA, we, we post all of our warning letters on our website at FDA.gov. Um, next steps include the firm's response to the warning letter and FDA's determination on, on the adequacy of that response, and then we also do a subsequent inspection to verify the compliance. Another question was, microbial testing is a moment in time because it continues to grow. Could the levels of tested ink now be elevated, and is this a concern? So the firms who, whose product demonstrated level of microbes that were below the BAM 23 standards, we held a regulatory meeting with them to discuss the implications in their next step. But we can't really elaborate on those discussions. Next slide. So um, this is some of that follow-up where we um, talked to those firms that had the low-level micro microbial contamination and um, we followed up with regulatory meetings of those firms um, to find out if they had conducted st stability, sterility testing and uh, asked about their methods that they used in the, um, to conduct that testing. And we also discussed misbranding issues with them. Next slide. Okay, here are our parting considerations. The applications of tattoos are 
are under state and local jurisdictions. So that's the actual applying of those tattoos. FDA regulates the inks and the pigments used in tattooing. The color additives are pre-approved or they require FDA pre-approval. And to date, no petition has been submitted for pre-approval for any color additive used in tattoo ink. We continue to be concerned about microbial contamination of tattoos and the labeling of tattoo inks is sterile when we know that they're not. Um, safe, safety substantiation remains the responsibility of the manufacturer and FDA has to prove the harm. Next slide. Okay, that's my contact information and where I'm located. And um, that's the end of both of my presentations, so I guess I'm ready for questions. All right, our first question is, why doesn't FDA regulate FDA ink? Why doesn't FDA regulate what? FDA ink, so I guess tattoo ink. We do regulate the tattoo ink. Because those are the things that the, the pigments in the ink impart the color. And so those are considered color additives and we regulate those under um, the regulations, Code of Federal Re Regulations of Part 73, 74, and 82. And they're all listed and have to be pre-approved. Right. Uh, the next question is, some, some pigments have expiration dates and some are not listed. The code does not talk about expiration dates. How does FDA feel about enforcement of expiration dates? And what about the ones that don't have expiration dates listed? Well, currently there's nothing in the, in the Code of Federal Regulations that require a manufacturer to have an expiration date on their product. However, if they do have an expiration date, then we would expect them to have stability data that demonstrates that the product is effective for its intended use for as long as, you know, up until that, that expiration date. All right, next question is, how can it be said that safety hasn't been demonstrated when there's over 30 years of thousands of people with tattoos that do not present any issues? Well, in fact, that was our reasoning for not having exercised our authority over tattoo inks and color pigments in the past. However, recently, um, you know, in the early 2000s and in the 2010s, um, that safety has been called into question simply because of the number of adverse reactions that we've received. And in our testing, we've demonstrated microbial contamination. And to piggyback off of that question and response, um, so there's also the question of how many of the adverse reactions can absolutely be attributed to only pigment contamination when technique and technician experience can be responsible for reactions, and also how the customers look after the healing tattoo. Well, um, as far as technique is concerned, that wouldn't be um, under FDA jurisdiction. So if in fact that is the case, when we get adverse reactions, we investigate those um, those complaints and reactions. And if it's determined that it was um, based on the uh, application rather than the actual pigment, then that's handed off to the local jurisdiction and they would have they would investigate it further. We're only looking at the inks themselves. So if we investigate and it's 
is determined not to be an ink issue, then we would hand that, that off to um, the state and local jurisdiction. All right, um, next question is, since no pigments have been approved for cosmetic purposes, what would you suggest local government inspectors inspect for when it comes to looking at ink being used at permanent cosmetic facilities? Well, I don't think that, um, and, and I don't really know the answer to this question because I don't know what the, State and local jurisdictions. For. Um, I don't. Know, I, I I really can't answer that question at this point. Um, I can try and take that back and see if I can and and see if um, my boss, my colleagues, have a, a response for that. All right. Um, next question is, I have heard in the past that pigment colors are FDA approved, but not the actual ink. Is this wrong? Um, the pigment itself is a color additive, and so it needs to be pre-approved. That's correct. The ink is considered um, a cosmetic and so falls under the FDA jurisdiction. If that makes it a little bit more clear. All right. Um, how do we know if a color additive is approved? Because it would be listed in part 73, 74, or 82 in the Code of Federal Regulations. Every color is listed. All right. Um, what is the stance of the FDA for BB Glow inks, which are pigments mixed with components that claim to provide medical benefits, such as a vitamin serum, as being a tattoo? Wow. I have not heard of that. So I will have to. Um, Take that back to my and try. All right. Um, the next one is comment about historic ingredients of mercury and cadmium. Do you still believe this is happening? It was not stated. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, a uh, comment about historic ingredients of mercury and cadmium. Do you still believe that those are being used? Um, I don't know. I just know that there are, um, periodically we do check for heavy metals like that. I don't know if we have found any of recent or recently but I know that we still check for them. So I can't say yay or nay to that. All right. Um, the next question is, why are pigments allowed to be used in body art if none of them are approved? Again, because, um, it, it, well, uh, one of the, the um, participants talked about 30 years of safety in the industry, and that indeed was one of the reasons why we hadn't exercised our authority in the past. Um, in addition, well, yes, yeah, and, and in addition, we had some competing priorities. But now, because um, inks are coming up contaminated, and we're finding a, finding a lot of uh, microbial contamination in the inks, it's it's causing that that safety to be to come into question, and so as a result of that, we're um, starting to ask the question: Well, why aren't uh, the industry putting forth color additive petitions so that we can get these pre-approved and the safety can be demonstrated? All right. Um. 
The next one is, I use some in pens inks. Is there a way I can find out the batch numbers of the inks with the issues? Yeah, it would be on the um, FDA website in the recall section. All right. Um, the next question is, do all states license and regulate tattoo artists? And does FDA work with local and state governments to license or regulate facilities? Um, I can't really answer that. I don't know what each state does in, in the body art industry. Um, and FDA typically will, does not work with the states because we regulate different parts of what's going on here. Um, FDA regulates the inks and the color pigments, and the states and locals regulate the actual application and the uh, um, artists. All right. Um, the next question is, what is FDA's plan for a new color additive po policy, and how is that going to be issued to the public? Um, at this point, it's, it's still in the discussion phases, so I can't really um, comment on that. And as far as being issued to the public, um, once the policy is developed, we have um, procedures in place to get that out. Usually, it'll, it'll include um, posting on our website. Okay. Next is, are pigment manufacturers inspected by FDA? Yes, we, in, in 2018, we did 12 um, manufacturers and we plan to do more in the future. Okay, the next question is, has there been an influx of complications and adverse reactions to tattooing since production overseas has been ramped up. Could you repeat that question, Laurel? Yeah. Has there been an influx of complications and adverse reactions to tattoo ink since production overseas has been ramped up? Um, I don't really have an answer for that because um, that's not the way we necessarily monitor, um, you know, our adverse reactions when they come in, they come in, we don't necessarily know the reason for the ramp up other than um, what we're seeing in the adverse reactions and how they're communicated to us. So um, I don't really have an answer for that. I don't know whether the increase in adverse reactions was due to the ramp up in Europe or whether it was due to some other outside stimulus. Okay, um, the next question is, is it correct to state that FDA regulates tattooing but does not approve tattooing? I think yes. Um, we approve the color additives or the pigments, but we do regulate the inks, but not necessarily approve the inks. Okay. Um, next question is, how can regulators determine if a particular ink is approved by FDA, is there a list of approved body art inks on the FDA website? No, there is not. Um, going back to the previous question, we only approve the pigments, the colorants um, that go into the inks, not the inks themselves. Thank you. How, um, I hope I understand this question correctly. Um, so how is it determined though if there is no minimum standard? 
in what context? Minimum standard for what? I, I, I don't do tattooing in general. I don't know. Um, well, if, if you're talking about minimum standard for um, tattoo inks, which is what we regulate, um, I, I still don't really understand the context per se. I mean, we have minimum standards for microbial co contamination, so which is what we've been um, finding here of late in the tattoo inks, and that's why we've increased our, our look at the tattoo inks. But we, we do have those minimal standards, which is um, anything, um, a thousand colony forming units or more for microbial contamination. Um, it, it's, it's difficult for me to answer that question without knowing the context. Okay. Um. Next question is, would you consider most of these problems lie within the manufacturing process? Well, um, the manufacturer is responsible for the safety of their product. So until, until it could be proved otherwise, uh, we, you know, we're assuming that the manufacturer has to be responsible because um, the product the, it, it's occurring in their product, and we're finding it in unopened product. So, or you know, that was product that was sealed at the manufacturer, and we're purchasing it, you know, and and looking at those products and finding the microbial contamination. So, yes, that would make it man, the manufacturer's responsibility. All right. Um, next question is, um, do you know if there's a greater percentage of cosmetic ink problems versus decorative ink problems? No, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the next one is, in this presentation, he talked about that the last major influx of ink related issues that were found were found in 2014. Has there been a follow up to what has been reported since then as far as ink related reactions or issues caused by the ink since 2014? Um, well, if you're speaking about actual adverse reactions, we're seeing those on a regular basis currently. Um, I have not personally seen them, but I know that our adverse reaction staff, uh, adverse event staff is, is um, getting those on a regular basis. It's not just since 2014, it's up through currently. Next question is, um, why historically was tattoo ink done by enforcement discretion, or sorry, enforcement discretion, and um, over the last decade or so, there seems to be increased enforcement? It's simply because um, we used our discussion because there was no demonstration of a problem with safety before. And so we could divert our resources to um, higher priority um, issues. But now that we're starting to see an increase in um, micro, uh, microbial contamination, um, we're questioning where the safety, what, what's happened to the safety of tattoo inks. And so now we're taking a look at it. All right. The next one is, what is the FDA stance on nanotechnology being developed in the ink? Could you repeat, please, Laurel? Yeah. What is the FDA stance on nanotechnology being developed in the ink? 
Um, I, I can't really answer that right now. Um, as far as I know, well, no, I, I just can't answer that right now. Right. Um, is there a way to know the manufacturers who had no issues with FDA standards, the ones who were considered safe when tested? Um, I don't know if we listed it on our website, but that would be the, if, if we did list it, then um, it would be on our FDA website. Okay, and um, the next one is, how are inks purchased from out of the country sources approved? Um, again, there, we don't actually approve the inks. So inks that come through um, the imported process are they're just normally come through the the that whole import process that's already set up through FDA, um, and then they can be um, distributed by the importer of record. So we don't actually approve the inks. We only approve the colorants. The um, the pigments that are put into the inks. Right. Uh, next is, has the FDA been assessing long-term effects of tattoo ink? Um, I will have to take that question back to my colleagues and, and try and generate a response. Okay. Um, next is, is there a body of tattoo experts involved with the FDA to help regulate or help provide accurate information? Could you repeat that question, please? Yes. Is there a body of tattoo experts involved with the FDA to help regulate or help provide accurate information? Um, not tattoo experts per se, but we have um, color additive experts and um, cosmetic experts. Um, the next question is, how is FDA notified of an adverse reaction to ink? Um, there are several ways to notify us. It's usually through our MedWatch database or um, as some, an, an individual or health professional could fill out a MedWatch form or they could contact um, their local FDA office. Right. Um, next question is, does FDA sample and test imported tattoo ink? Well, um, I don't think that we have, but it doesn't say that we couldn't. We definitely could do that, um, but I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure that we have. I would have to check and get back. Mm -hmm. um, is enforcement discretion tax? approval of inks currently used in tattoo ink and permanent makeup. Wow. Could you say that one again, please? <laughs> Is enforcement discretion um, for approval of inks currently used in tattoo ink and permanent makeup? Um, no. Because of the safety issues that we have um, discovered, we aren't necessarily using enforcement discretion at this time. We're um, actively looking at um, tattoo inks and um, developing enforcement strategy. Um, next question is, what's the difference between ink and colorant? 
Okay, the colorant is the, the actual pigment that goes into the ink. The ink is that colorant plus um, diluents, um, stabilizers, preservatives, etc. So the ink is a, a solution or a formulation, if you will. The colorant is the actual color that um, gives the ink color, if you will. Um, next is, does FDA determine sterility of tattoo ink following USP sterilization testing methods? If not, how can FDA say a product is sterile or not? FDA doesn't um, say a product is sterile or not. What FDA does is we test the um, inks and determine if microbes are present or bacteria is present but we don't we don't say that a, a product is sterile or not All right. um the next question is noticed on the fda recall website that no inks in the past two years have been recalled did something change in the regulation? No, we actually had recalls of tattoo inks in 2019. So, and, and those recalls are actually posted on the FDA website. We can find that link and post it with the webinar when it's posted so we have the most current link on the AFTA website. Yeah, I think that link is actually included in my slides as well. Oh, perfect. All right, then we can just um, post your slides and people can find that um, link there. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, please bear... Please verify, are colorants approved by the FDA for cosmetics, or are they approved by the FDA for tattooing? Both. FDA approves the uh, um, color additives for use in foods, drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices. Tattoo inks are considered cosmetics, so that's the whole of that. All right. Um, should testing a product for contamination only rely on what's within the pigment, or shouldn't we be looking at whether this leads directly to adverse reactions, and what should the minimum standard be for measuring adverse reactions? I can't answer that question right now. I'll have to take that back and, and try and um, get an answer from my colleagues. All right. Um, has there ever been adverse reactions due to mixing of inks or pigments? Could you please repeat? Yeah, has there ever been adverse reactions due to mixing of inks or pigments? I can't say specifically um, because I haven't reviewed all of the adverse reactions that we've gotten. Um, the, that would be information that would be included um, on whoever reported the adverse reaction, whether or not there was a mixing of, an, of inks and whether that actually led to an adverse reaction, I, I can't really say. All right. Um, the next one is cosmetic and color additive experts aren't tattoo experts. Why are there no tattoo experts to help provide correct information? I can't answer that. Um, are cosmetics experts tattoos are cosmetics so um 
I don't necessarily agree that we would need a quote unquote tattoo expert um, to regulate the tattoo inks necessarily because the tattoo inks are made of co uh, color additives and we have color additive experts. They're considered a cosmetic, which falls under a general category or a general definition as listed in the law. And so um, I, I just don't think that we necessarily need a tattoo expert to regulate the industry or the inks. Um, next is enforcement discretion is used for pigments. Why should industry ask to be regulated? Why should, could you repeat that please? Yes, enforcement discretion is used for pigments. Why should industry ask to be regulated? Well, I, I I don't really understand what what what's meant by why industry would ask to be regulated. Um, they're not necessarily asking to be regulated. They are regulated based on the law. So I, I don't necessarily understand the question. Okay. Um. Next question is, so if ink includes colorant, why doesn't FDA regulate ink as well? We do regulate the ink. We regulate the ink as a cosmetic. We regulate the colorant as a color additive. So we regulate both. Right. Um, okay, next question is, so there's honestly no way to know that manufacturers are telling the truth on their label. They're just, in some cases, hoping they don't get checked and consumers have no guarantee. This is frightening. That wasn't a question. That was a statement. <laughs> so, um, so, so I guess the question is, are, <laughs> is there any way to tell that if the manufacturers are telling the truth on their label? Well, uh, the way the re the regulation is written and the way the law is written, FDA can only um, um, regulate cosmetics post market. In other words, we we can only regulate after things are already out there for sale. We can't. We don't have pre approval authority other than with the cos the um, color additive. So. All other cosmetics, other than color additives, have, are out there on the market before we can actually do anything um, as far as regulation. And again, we're limited by the number of resources that we have available to us. So we can't regulate every single cosmetic that's out there, including tattoo inks. We have to do a sampling as our resources become available to us. Um, I understand that, that it is frightening, but um, this is what we have available to us. All right. Next question is, if a product is misbranded due to stating a product is labeled sterile in BAM 23, adequate to determine sterility? No, BAM 23 actually provides methods for um, microbial analysis. It doesn't determine sterility. Um, what BAM microbes are present and, and, and how many are present. And so it's, it sets the standards that way. Anything over a thousand colony, colony forming units is um, of concern to us. So, but sterility is based on um, something like USP 51 or USP 61. That's 
a little bit different than what BAM does. Okay. Um, if ink is a cosmetic, why doesn't FDA approve ink? Because FDA doesn't approve cosmetics. All the cosmetics um, are, we only, we, we don't have pre-approval for cosmetics. Cosmetics get to be on the market first before we can even do anything with them. And we, and the way the law is written, um, it puts the onus for the safety of those cosmetics on the manufacturer. Once they're out in the market, then FDA has to prove that there is harm before we can even take an action. So there is no pre-approval that is written in the law for cosmetics. All right. Um, next question is, the law for cosmetic and color additives is, out, is outdated and was made before tattooing was really understood. It's applied in a different means than all the other applications for traditional cosmetics. So why should it be included in the same group and not have its own additional experts? Yes, the law was written in, in 1938, but it still, it, it still can be applied to tattoo inks because of the nature of the inks. They are considered cosmetics based on the law. They're used to beautify the body. So that actually makes them fall under the, the, the definition of a cosmetic. So because of that, um, they are considered a cosmetic. We, I mean, you know, whether or not a tattooist is needed on our staff in order for us to understand the basics of, of cosmetics or the color inks is is um up to debate i mean obviously the um the 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 person that, that's writing these questions feels like that there should be somebody um on our staff for that is a tattoo expert i don't i can't really answer that all right. Um, next question is, have there been more problems since permanent cosmetics became popular than when basic body tattooing was the most common form of body art? I don't have the answer to that question. I don't have um, data that would uh, say one way or the other at this point at least not um, at my fingertips. I could take that question back and, and see if I can get a response. All right. Um, I'm gonna pick one more um, that hasn't already been addressed. Let me see. Um, looks like everything has been answered. Um, there are there have been a few questions of will we is there going to be a recording of this or will there be a copy of the slides and Amy correct me if I'm wrong yes there will be the recording available um, next week or the week after on the AFTO website. The recording and the slides will be available on the AFTO professional development page um, either later this week or most likely early next week. All right. And um, Amy, did you want to do any phone questions or? Um, oh, no, I probably don't have any hands raised. So I would just like to thank Kay for doing this presentation for us. Okay, thank you. And um, for those questions that I wasn't able to answer, can I get a copy of those so that um, I can take them back to my staff and, and we can develop some answers for those? Yes, absolutely. I can print out the questions and I will find those and send them to you. Okay, great. 
Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for joining this webinar, and we hope you guys have a good rest of your day.